Hello friends, you are watching 3ABN Sabbath School panel and we want to welcome you to, for joining us this week, week number five, as we're making our way again through the study, managing for the master till he comes. And this week's lesson is entitled Dealing with Debt. When you say the word debt, people get nervous. And, uh, you know, probably rightfully so, because it's not God's plan for us to be in debt. And we're going to learn about that this week and how you can even get out of debt. God has a plan for your life. If you or someone or you know, you or someone you know may be in debt, tune in. You don't want to miss this week. Uh, as we get prepared to dive into our lesson, let's go ahead and introduce the Sabbath School panelist. To my left here is Miss Jill Morricone. What's your lesson about this week? Thank you, Ryan. Excited to be here. Following Godly Counsel. Nice. All right. And then Miss Shelley Quinn. Mine is a very practical lesson. Tuesdays is how to get out of debt. Amen. And then, of course, Pastor John Loma King for Wednesday. Wow, this is really an earth-shaking one. Surety and get rich quick schemes. Ooh, all right. I'm looking forward to that one. And all the way at the end of the table, Pastor John Denzi, what do you have? I have Thursday's uh, lesson, and it's interesting because the Bible does have term limits and borrowing points. All right, all right. Going to be an interesting study indeed. But of course, as always, we dare not dive into such an important topic or any Bible study without first going to the Lord in prayer. So I'm going to ask Pastor John Denzi, if you would, pray for us, brother. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for the blessing of life, for the blessing of your Holy Scriptures. We thank you, Lord, that we can have this Sabbath School panel so that you can work through us. We pray that you will work through us. Bless us with your Holy Spirit that we will speak the words that will bring healing and inspiration and encouragement to your children. Mm -hmm. We pray for a blessing upon everyone that will hear this program wherever they may be in this world. We pray that you will guide them and help them as they face financial difficulties, financial decisions, and decisions that will be for eternal life. We ask in Jesus' holy and blessed name, amen. 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 Thank you. Our memory text for this week comes from Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 7. And it says, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. And that is certainly true. Sabbath afternoon's lesson brings out that one definition of debt is living today on what you expect to earn in the future. Hmm. That's the truth. Yeah. Today, debt seems to be a way of life, but it should not be the norm for Christians. The Bible discourages debt. In, in the scriptures, there is at least 26 references to debt, and all are negative. It does not say that it is a sin to borrow money, but it does talk about the often bad consequences of doing so. When considering financial obligations, Paul counseled, of course, in Romans chapter 13, verses 7 and 8, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. He said, render therefore to all their due, and he says, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, owe no one anything except to love one another. I love that. I love that. Of course, it goes on to say, why is debt an almost international scourge at every level, personal, corporate, and government? Every society has always had at least a small percentage who were in debt. But today, a much larger portion of the people are in debt, and it's almost never to their benefit. And uh, that sets us up for this week. And we're going to be dealing with this debt issue. And that's in fact, actually the title of the lesson, Dealing with Debt. And uh, we're going to move on to Sunday's lesson, which is entitled The Debt Problems. And it takes us to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Of course, we have read from the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy a few times in this lesson so far, and it probably won't be the last, but there are some incredible counsels that we can find there if we just simply humble ourselves and listen to what the Lord has to teach us. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1, 2, and 12. Yes, Deuteronomy chapter 28. Let me reiterate that. Deuteronomy 28 verses, we're going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to skip to verse 12 for the sake of time. But the Bible says here in Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 and onward, it says, Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all His commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. 
Verse 2, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And now we're going to skip down to verse 12 and notice what it says. It says, the Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You see, again, it's not a sin to borrow as the lesson brought out, but certainly it has come. History has taught us that it comes with lots of bad consequences, if not done responsibly and properly. And uh, the lesson brings out that studies show that there are three primary reasons that people get into financial difficulty. And of course, these three reasons are listed here. And I was doing my own research and I found that everything that I came up on, even though I went to certain websites and certain financial, uh, you know, credible financial institutions that talked about debt, every single reason, even beyond a list of three, maybe they had eight reasons or nine reasons or 10 reasons, literally came back and fell under these three reasons that we're going to find here in the lesson. And the first one is, the, the first is ignorance. I think all of us can probably fall into that category at some point. I'm going to tell you a little bit of my personal testimony if time permits. But ignorance is the first one. Many people, even the educated, are financially illiterate. Uh, they were simply never exposed to biblical or even uh, secular principles of money management. There is hope, however, the lesson brings out, uh, that uh, the lesson will provide a simple outline of these principles and how to apply them. So we're going to be touching on that. But of course, the second reason is, is uh, for or financial difficulties uh, is, is basically greed and selfishness. And that's certainly true today. Uh, in response to advertising and personal desire, people simply live beyond their means. They aren't willing to live in, drive, or wear what they can really afford. That's like, that describes our culture to the T. Yeah. Hmm. Many of these same people also feel that they are just too poor to tithe. And we've been talking about tithing and returning the tithe to the Lord and returning offerings. And some people say, oh, you know what, I just can't afford it. I, I can't give because I'm just too poor. I don't have enough. But yet you look at their lavish lifestyle and all the th other things that they're spending money on beyond their means. And you can say, yeah, with proper money management, you can obviously return to the Lord what is His. It goes on to say, as a consequence, they live their lives without God's promise, wisdom, and blessing, according to Malachi 3:11. Uh, 3 verses 10 and 11 and also Matthew chapter 6 33 uh, and of course we know that there are hope for these people but it requires a change of heart and a spirit of contentment which is a big one we need the Holy Spirit to give us a spirit of contentment to be happy with what the Lord has provided for us and of course the third reason people find themselves in financial difficulty is personal misfortune um, they may have experienced a serious illness without adequate health insurance. Some people have been in that situation. Uh, they may have, uh, have been abandoned by a uh, spin-thrift marriage partner. A natural disaster may have wiped out their possessions or they may have been born and raised in abject poverty. There is hope for these people, of course, and uh, though their path is more difficult, their troubles can be overcome. Uh, change may come in the support of Christian friends, uh, the counsel and assistance of godly counselors, hard work coupled with good education and the blessing and providence of God. You know, I think back on my own personal journey and there were many years ago when me and my wife, my wife and I were starting out, my goodness, um, we, we first, we had not, uh, I look at these reasons here and we kind of fall in the, each one of these categories, spending beyond our means at times. And, uh, you know, there were some misfortunes that came around, but the, the main thing was I, I was so ignorant early on to money management. I'd never been taught proper money management. And so, you know, here we are getting credit cards and we're like, woohoo, all this stuff is available to us. And we didn't, we just thought, you know, again, in our minds, we'll just pay them off. Everybody intends to pay off their credit cards, right? Uh, but then it, of course it snowballs, gets out of control and then you find yourself in a horrible situation. There was a time in which I was Oh, me, my wife and I were over $80,000 in debt. And, uh, and there came a time where I was like, how did we get to this point? And it, I realized that it was just proper money, you know, improper money management, just ignorance and a few misfortunes and spending beyond our means. All of that together kind of culminated to this massive debt to a young couple early on. And it's quite interesting because I think sometimes we have it backwards in society. You can send kids to school today and nowadays it's being reported that kids are going to school and they're taking time out to teach 
teach them sexually perverse educations and things like that that they're coming away with, but we certainly don't educate our young people on proper money management, how to do their taxes and many other things that actually apply to real life. Maybe we should be doing that in education. But in this case, I remember back on my own story and we, we, we were at just over $80,000 at debt at one time. And I remember my wife and I just said, you know what, no more. We've got, to, we've got to pull ourselves out of this. Now, many people probably would have filed bankruptcy to try to escape or whatever. But one day we were watching some, some programs and we came across a gentleman who had written a, a, a book. And, uh, and, we, and it was a very prominent gentleman in society, a Christian man who, who offers financial advice. He's a self-made millionaire. And, uh, and so he wrote this book. We, we bought the book. We followed every point to the T and many of his principles were based on biblical principles. We thought, okay, Lord, you, we, we, we messed up getting into this debt, but Lord, we're asking you to help us get out of it. Help us to put us on a plan that will help us get out of this. It took us over three years, a lot of prayer and a lot of hard work, but praise God, uh, we can say we're debt free today. And, 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 and I don't brag on that. I just praise God for it because if you practice proper money management and you follow the principles of God's word, God will bless you tremendously beyond what you can imagine. It just takes a little bit of, uh, well, you have to be content with what you have as, as the lesson brings out. And it takes a lot of hard work, prayer and dedication and putting yourself on a budget, which I think Michelle is probably going to talk a little bit about what, how important it is to put yourself on a budget. I had to learn the definition of that. I didn't know what budget meant early on in my, <laughs> in my marriage and in my, my younger years. But, you know, I just want to uh, finish up with highlighting what Jesus Christ brings out in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 34. We have, we have mentioned these verses many times, and it probably won't be the last time you hear them. But again, repetition is a great teacher, and the more that we hear these, in fact, there may be someone watching right now that has not been following these lessons, and they're going to hear these words for the very first time today. And I want to highlight the beautiful counsel that we find in Matthew chapter 6, mm -hmm. verses 31 to 34. These are Jesus' words himself, and this is what he says. He says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? You know, many people, they worry about these things. And oftentimes out of that worry, they put themselves in financial situations that they never dreamed that they would be in. But it goes on to say in verse 32, for after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Of course, the Gentiles here in reference to the heathen, those people that are not in the will of God, those people who live according to the world standards and not according to God's standards. But he goes on to say, for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. I had to learn early on, you know what? Uh, God is going to provide for me. I don't have to provide for myself. I don't have to go beyond my means and spend, you know, carelessly beyond my means because I think I want this and I need this. God will provide your means if you will just be patient and follow according to his will and put him first. And of course, verse 34 says, therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow Tomorrow will worry about its own. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know what? Follow the shepherd today. Let the shepherd get you what you need for today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Trust in him. Trust in his plan. And he will see you through even in a debt problem situation. Amen. Thank you so much, Ryan. What a great study. I love the personal experience. Um, Jill Morricone, I have Monday's lesson, which is following godly counsel. And I actually want to start out with a personal experience as well. So it's interesting. I came into our marriage when Greg and I got married uh, with no knowledge of money. I'm grateful because my husband had knowledge of money. His mm -hmm. parents had taught him and not that mine didn't teach me. I think I just didn't learn for whatever reason. So when we got married, uh, talking about following godly counsel, I followed my husband's counsel and his counsel was based on the word of God. And I remember him saying, first, we always return tithe and offering. And I said, okay, that's great. You know, I believe in tithe and offering, 10% tithe, and I'll give a little bit of offering. He said, no, Jilly, I've covenanted with God that I give 10% tithe and minimum of 10% offering. And I said, what are you talking about? That's 20%. We're living on his income. He made like eight bucks an hour. So how are we going to do this? And so he said, in, in offering, we know in the word of God, there's no percentage. That was a personal contract with him and God. And he said, well, we're going to live on a budget. And I said, oh, okay, I like the sound of budgets. And then he said, okay, looking at all our expenses and what we have, you can have $25 a week for groceries. 
And now it's 20 years since then. You can never live on $25 a week for groceries. But even 20 years ago, it was almost impossible because that was our toothpaste and shampoo and toilet paper plus groceries. And I remember the first two years of our marriage, I never bought a box of crackers. We didn't buy any box cereal. We lived on oatmeal and beans and cornmeal and rice. I remember not going to the store because then I'd want to buy clothes. So we went six months and I'd say, I won't even look because then I'm not going to buy any clothes. But the beauty of paying off credit card debts, paying off car loan, paying off a mortgage on a house. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget the day we paid everything and we owed nothing. And then the gift of that, the freedom in that, being able to follow that godly counsel. And those years, are I make it sound like it was hard. It was actually kind of funny looking back on it. But they're the best memories of our marriage. Mm -hmm. I love those years of scrimping and saving together and, and doing it together with God. It was an incredible experience. As we talk about following godly counsel, you could say, return your tithe, pay your offerings. You could say, stop buying on credit card, live within your means. Mm -hmm. You could say, pay off what you owe, that snowball effect. But money is not a curse. Money is a blessing, is it not? Mm -hmm. It's to be used to support our families, that's a gift. It's to be used to spread the gospel, that's a gift. It's to be used to help the poor and needy, that's a gift. That's why God blesses us with money. With the proper management, God blesses us so that we can in turn extend that blessing to someone else. But what if money in our lives becomes an idol? What then? I want to talk to you about six keys for breaking the idolatry of the love of money. Now, we're not saying money's evil. Of course it's not. But when it becomes an idol and we put it in the place of God, what do we do then? Here's six keys to breaking that idolatry. Key number one is to make a choice. Let's look at Matthew 6, verse 24. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mm -hmm. Mammon is an Aramaic word for wealth. Mm -hmm. In the first century AD, people were focused on obtaining wealth. Wealth became the God of their lives. And today, in our materialistic society, selfish prosperity has become our goal. I want my car to be a brand new car. I want my house to be a super fancy house. I want my clothes to be designer clothes. I want the best of everything. Selfish prosperity becomes our goal. So we're to make a choice. What do you want from life? Mm -hmm. Who will you serve? What will you focus on? What is important to you, God or money? Right. If you're caught in that trap of money being an idol in your life, the first key is to simply make a choice. Serve God, not money. Let's look at the second uh, key, which is love God. We're going to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 15. 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, it's interesting to me, I was never super good in math, but I remember in math taking geometry. Do you remember those geometric proofs, those deductive reasonings, you know, that rationale that you had there? So if we look at this text from that logical perspective, what is our purpose? What do we want to do? We want to love God. That was key number two, was to love God. So how do we do that from this text? The text says what? Do not love the world or the things in the world. So we're not supposed to love the world. But how am I, Ryan, not supposed to love the world? Right. I don't know how to do that. How do I not love the world? The next part actually tells you how, and it's interesting. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Mm -hmm. So basically it's saying that loving the world is incongruent with loving God. You can't do both. You can't love the world and love God at the same time. So if you want to stop loving the world, it's as simple as this, love God. 
Yes. Focus your attention on God. Look at Jesus. Love him. Don't try. So many times we try not to do what we're not supposed to do. I don't know about you, but I do that. You know, I'm not supposed to love the world, so I'm not going to focus on the world. I'm not going to love the world. No, just focus on loving God. Mm -hmm. And by extension, you will naturally lose that love for the world. Key number three, keep life in perspective. First John 2, we're still in First John. First John 2, next two verses, 16 and 17. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Yeah. What we think is important is not always important. The world, it passes away. But life with God is secure. Keep life in perspective. Understand that the things we think are important really aren't even that important. And that God and his word are what is important. Mm -hmm. Key number four, practice contentment. You talked about mm -hmm. this, Ryan. Practice contentment with what you have. First Timothy 6, verse 16 says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Later, Paul goes on to discuss the love of money being the root of all evil. But the key here is to practice being content with what God's given you. Don't look for what's outside of that. Just say, God, I'm thankful. And, I'm, and that's not always easy. Woo, that's hard. Mm -hmm. But to be content and grateful for what I have right now. Philippians 4, Paul says it Similarly, Philippians 4, 11 and 12, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need, to be content no matter what state we're in. Key number five to breaking that idolatry, the love of money. Key number five, reach out to other people in need. Nothing better to break that selfishness in my own heart mm -hmm. than when I reach out to someone else who needs it even more than I do. Luke 12, verse 33, sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags, which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. Giving, it reduces the selfishness in my own heart. Proverbs 19, I like this. Proverbs 19, verse 17. He was pity on the poor, actually lends to the Lord. What an incredible promise that we're not just giving it because someone needs. No, no, no. It's like giving to Jesus himself when we reach out. Finally, the last key, key number six, practice gratefulness. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Mm -hmm. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. Give with cheerfulness and thanksgiving. So if money has somehow worked itself into an idol in your heart, practice these principles and watch as God sets you free. Mm, amen. Thank you so much. Beautifully put, Jill. Don't go anywhere, my friends. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3AB and Sabbath School panel. And we're now making our way to Tuesday's lesson with Ms. Shelley Quinn. Mm, and I hope to get to budgeting. It's actually not in our Tuesday lesson, but we're going to try to add that. I'm Shelley Quinn. Tuesday is how to get out of debt. And I have Proverbs 22, 7 is the really uh, one scripture I know I'm going to share with you. It says the rule, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the servant of the lender. There are three types of debt. 
there are necessary loans. Uh, sometimes it's for a mortgage or a car. There are, or maybe even a student loan. There are debt from circumstances. Perhaps you've lost your job and you had to live on credit for a while. You had nothing or maybe a medical emergency. But then there is the reckless spending debt. This is people who have, they, they want instant gratification. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, my, I was praying all through the Christmas season because you saw all these people out there running up their credit cards and they were people who were already in debt. Did you know if you buy something on a credit card because you're thinking, woohoo, it's 50% off. If you're paying minimum payment, it's going to take you eight to nine years mm -hmm. to pay that off and you are going to pay more than double mm -hmm. of what the actual price was. So we, we need to avoid the high rate credit card debt. So to get out of debt, you've got to change your attitude, you've got to change your life habits, and sometimes you have to change your circumstances. You may need to get a second job or something. But spending more than you earn, when you're buying on by credit card, just because it's something you desire, or if you're dipping into your savings, we all should have a, an emergency savings mm -hmm. account, but you also wanna be saving for retirement. And sometimes people start dipping into the retirement. You are hurting yourself when you do that. Mm -hmm. So what we wanna do is make certain when you do have a necessary loan that you don't go beyond what your ability is to pay. Let me tell you something, being in debt is exceedingly cruel. It limits your life. And as I've, you know, I've said, we were $250,000 in debt when we got married because of a crooked business partner. We didn't file bankruptcy. We wanted to make certain that we repaid all of that. But Jill, I went through the same experience as you did, but I'm the budgeter. But here's the point. We need to put limits on ourselves now yeah. so that we can meet our financial goals. And when you're in debt, you can't. I wanna read directly from the Adult Bible Study Guide. Here's what he says, because what we're looking at is if you're in debt, I mean, woohoo, we are debt free now, praise the Lord. But if you are in debt, it doesn't have to be a life sentence. If you can get out of $80,000 worth of debt in three years, yeah. It's doable. So what uh, Ed Reed writes to us is he said, here's the premise. You're going to make a plan to get out of debt and escape the bondage. He says, the premise is a commitment to God to be faithful in returning his holy tithe so that you can access his wisdom and blessing because he's eager to bless those who obey him. We've read this over and over. By putting God first, you'll receive this wisdom and, and he will help you. This is how Greg, he put God first. Greg taught him how to do, uh, how to manage what he has. Step one, he's got three steps here. Declare a moratorium on additional debt. No more credit spending. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I tell people to do? Put those credit cards in an ice, tray. put them in a plastic bag in ice, freeze them and put them up there. I, I mean, it doesn't hurt to have a credit card because sometimes if your child suddenly got sick and you needed something right away, mm -hmm. but put that booger in the refrigerator and don't go after it. Um, if you don't borrow any more money, you can't get into further debt. Now, step two, this is interesting. Make a covenant with God from that this point on, when he blesses, you're going to pay off your debts as quickly as possible. Somebody gives you $50 for your birthday. Don't say, woohoo, let's go out to dinner. Put it on your debt load, pay That's down right. something. Um, this step, he says, it, when God blesses you financially, use the money to reduce the debt, not to purchase more things. This step is the most crucial. When most folks receive unexpected money, they simply spend it. Don't. 
Don't. Instead, apply it to your debt reduction plan because God clearly doesn't want us to be in debt. So once the covenant is made, he said many families find that God blesses them in unexpected ways. Why? Because God can now trust you with funds, right? And the debt is reduced faster than they anticipated. So step three, this is the hands-on practical part. Make a list of all your debts from the largest to the smallest in descending order. So here you've got your mortgage, you've got your car or maybe a student loan somewhere in there and you're going all down with your credit cards from the largest to the smallest. Now, he says, for most families, the home mortgage is at the top of the list, credit card or personal debts at the bottom. But when you begin your debt reduction, he says, make the, the, at least the minimum payment due on everything, but double up on the little one at the yes. bottom. Yes. Double it up, pay it off. And I know that when we were married, what we did, I, we'd pay off something and I'd cut up the credit card if it was, you know, I mean, there, if it was a department store credit card, you don't need all those credit cards. Um, and then it says, you'll be happily surprised how quickly you can eliminate the smallest debt and that motivates you. Mm -hmm. Then use the money that you were paying on that bottom one to double up and add to the basic payment of the next one. That's and right. step by step, you'll get out of of debt. As you eliminate your smaller, high interest debts, you free up a surprising amount of money to place on your next higher debts. That's what we did. And you know what? Yeah. When, when you're out, I mean, we were debt free except for our mortgage. And that's when I really got stingy. <laughs> it was so funny. I mean, with our personal spending, I wanted every extra penny to pay on the principal mm -hmm. and we paid our mortgage off in half the time. Yeah. And it was just because we were skipping things mm -hmm. that we didn't need. So here's, he says, by following these three simple steps, many families have become debt free and you can too. We've got two minutes left. Let me tell you, budgeting is something that so few people do and we should all be doing it. Every one of us, no matter what your income, we should be on a budget. Here's how you do it. List all of your income, then list all of your expenses, your mandatory expenses and your needs. Mandatory, to me, top of the list is I'm returning tithes. So the 10% tithe, because it's not ours, it belongs to the Lord. Your rent or your mortgage payment. Please, if you get a loan for a home, do not let it be more than 30% of your income or your rent. If it's more than 30%, you can't afford to live there. You know, your utilities, your food, your transportation to and from work, health and car insurance, debt repayment, list all of your debts down and something that you're contributing to your emergency fund. The reason so many people get into trouble is they don't have an emergency fund. You should have a minimum of three months of whatever you live on each month as an emergency fund. Yes. But now here's the other part, discretionary expenses. Now you're gonna list those. Cable TV, you don't need to be paying $100 a month for cable TV, especially if you're in debt. <laughs> Streaming services, gym memberships, get out and work in the yard. <laughs> Eating out and entertainment. We didn't eat out for probably close to 10 years, I think. We would, well, once, once a week, our, our little, we got a pizza once a week. And that was it. So the point is, and even home decor, the way I do things, I buy nice stuff, but I buy it one piece at a time when it's on a major, major sale at the end of the year. We'd have a chair, then we got a couch because we didn't get anything. I mean, I saved it up. So here's the point. Take control of your spending, make a budget, stick to it. Go online because you can find some fabulous information online of how to budget and get out of debt. You'll be free and you will be at liberty. Amen. I could tell that was coming from your heart. <laughs> oh, I tell you. 
But I tell you, I, I would never think of a credit card. I never thought of a credit card as a booger until right now. <laughs> so, which is what Shelly Quinn can do. Mine is an amazing one, surety and get rich quick schemes. There is no shortage of get rich quick schemes. I must blow the trumpet when it comes to cryptocurrency and all these things that seem too good to be true. Let me say this and I'll say it a number of times. If it seems too good to be true, what? It is not. People are living in a world where the number one aim of the world is to get the money out of your pocket and the number one aim of the credit card companies is to keep you a slave to them. Mm -hmm. that's and that's what happens. I was learning something. My wife and I like to look at these things having to do with finances. And we watch this uh, documentary on finances. We are in the category, we call, we're called deadbeats. Credit card companies don't like people that pay off their credit cards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, don't make money, they don't make money off of that's you. Right. They don't like, so what they do is when you pay your debt off, they keep increasing your limit, hoping that you'll somewhere along the way change your behavior and dive into debt. Mm -hmm. Dead, I'd rather be a deadbeat. My wife and I look at each other and said, I'm so glad to be a deadbeat mm -hmm. because the credit card companies, is, uh, they say, you got great credit, credit with us. Uh, so they increase the limit to hope along the way that you'll become narcissistic and start wasting money. It's so good to have those cards in case of emergency, like being stuck in India and your, your airline ticket is incorrect and you have to pay for an airline ticket rather than learn how to speak Indian. You know, I would get stuck in, I was stuck in Bangalore years ago and they said, you need to buy an airline ticket. Praise God for credit. We were able to get two airline tickets and fly where we needed to be. Or else we would have been stuck there even still to this day selling roti. So, uh, but I'm <laughs> glad we didn't. I want to make a very important point about this lesson. This is a very powerful lesson. Yeah. It can almost be put into a seminar. And I really appreciate J. Edward Reed. Uh, his, his knowledge of experience in this area is phenomenal. But let's read Proverbs 6, verse 1 to 5, so I could go ahead and dive into why it's important not to become a person that signs loans for other people. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Proverbs 6, verse 1. My son, if you become surety for your friend, if you shake hands and pledge for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth. Mm -hmm. You are taken by the words of your, of your mouth. So do this, my son, and deliver yourself. For you have come into the hand of your friend. Go and humble yourself. Mm. Plead with your friend. Give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter and like a bird from the hand of the fowler. And Proverbs 17, verse 18, a man devoid of understanding shakes hands in a pledge and becomes surety for his friend. Mm. One of the most dangerous things you can do is, because lenders, when they notice that you can't afford something, they say, get your, get your, get your aunt, get your brother, get your sister, get a family member to, you know, if they have good credit, let them become the co-signers. That's like building a gallows. Because after you sign that, after the person with good credit signs that, and Shelly, you guys' stories are amazing. After you sign that, that person can walk off into la-la land and mm. you're stuck with the debt. That's right. You might say, you didn't pay the loan this month. And they say, well, you know, I was a little short on cash. Your credit gets hit. Yeah. Well, what happened? Two months you haven't paid. I got a notice from the bank. Well, I was not feeling well. I couldn't go to work. You're stuck. And what happens is, while they're living at ease, you cannot sleep. That's why it says here, don't do that. A person devoid of understanding shakes hands within a pledge. So what's the, me what's the message here? When you are confronted with this ideology to help somebody, I like this, this is, it's better to give somebody something right. than, than say, pay me back. That's right. We don't give family members money. I mean, we don't lend family members money. We just give it to them. That's right. We don't, if they have a need, We'll buy something for them or send the money and say, N you don't have to pay us back. Because what happens is in those situations, when you see a person that, you know, they'll make sure they don't see you for a long time. <laughs> Whatever happened to so-and-so, we invited him to the, to the dinner. Well, you know, they got a headache so all of a sudden. They want to avoid you. And then when you see them, this is the most uncomfortable thing. When somebody owes you something, right. you see them while you're shaking their hand. Come on, let's shake hands. While you're shaking in your mind, you're saying, you ain't paid me for a long time. <laughs> And it's terrible because you put yourself at this, it hurts emotional relationships. It hurts family relationships. 
When you want to help somebody, help them. Don't expect anything in return That's good. because God will bless you. But do that wisely. Don't put your needed finances at risk because somebody has an emergency. My wife and I always said, don't let somebody else's need become your emergency. Because sometimes people hit you with a guilt trip. You don't like me. You know, they've done it even to our church. People have said they don't help us when we are helping them. But what, what they've done as they want us to become this uh, irresponsible overextender in our help of them and consider only their needs. And if you don't help us, then you must be the bad guy. Well, be very mindful of that You're because enabling them. it's terrible. You enable people. Uh, Proverbs 28 verse 20, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Mm -hmm. Cryptocurrency. Okay. Ooh, watch it. <laughs> Somebody may be fortunate enough to be blessed by that. But cryptocurrency is a risk. It's not backed by any, it's not backed by the FDIC. It's not backed by financial institutions. It's really a get rich quick scheme that many people, it's usually the people that get an early benefit, but then by the time you hear about it, it's too late. It's on the way down. Don't have somebody come up to you and say, hey, invest 5,000, 10,000, and I guarantee you, your money will double. That guarantee doesn't often happen. In more cases than not, people have said that to me. I said, okay, when the money comes back to you five months from now, you let me know how it does. And I always, my wife and I said, see there, told you. And, but we do that to family members. We don't allow strangers to pull us into things like that. Look at 1 Timothy 6, verse 9 and 10. I'm going to go faster because, Jill, I have six takeaways. Ooh. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptations and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Some people walk away from the Lord because they got a good job and they'll even violate the Sabbath because it is able to fulfill their financial desires. Point number one. Don't follow get rich quick schemes. And I read the text earlier. Do not be one of those who shake hands in a pledge, one of those who is a surety in debt. Do not follow get rich quick schemes. Don't sign and be a co-signer for someone else. It's going to hurt you. Second one, don't make emotional transactions. Mm -hmm. I, I read the text, but I'm going to add something. Don't make emotional transactions, meaning... When you become a co-signer or when you decide, say, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it for you, you might have the best of intentions. And you might even be dealing with a person who's in tears. You might say, let's find a way to handle this, but I'm not going to allow this emotional moment to become the reason why my life financially begins to fall apart. Because I've talked to so many people that have said, I can't find them. They move, they don't answer my texts, they mm -hmm. don't return calls. Yeah. And I asked their mom where they are, and she won't even tell me where they live. <laughs> it's going to hurt you. Third one, don't put your livelihood at risk. Proverbs 23, 5, will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, and they fly away like an eagle toward heaven. Mm. <laughs> That's what happens when people are chasing these things that seem to be good. You know, it's amazing. When you go to a store, and this is like, uh, you know, $600 for this item, but today it's 50% off. <laughs> it's only $300. You know what you end up doing? You buy two and you end up paying $600 anyway. <laughs> Watch out for those emotional spending. People that go to the store, and my wife and I have learned how to keep those salespersons at bay. They say, why is it always the last day for the sale? <laughs> you made, so my wife and I, we did this once at the Best Buy, and they said, today is the sale as any today. <clears throat> we said, well, we have a practice of praying about it. They had, they've not been trained to handle that. <laughs> we said, if the Lord wants us to have it, it'll be here when we come back. And they just go like... <laughs> they have not been trained to handle people of prayer. That's we right. do not do that emotionally. Fourth, don't lend money or charge interest to family members. Exodus 22, 25, if you lend money to any of my people who are poor among you, you shall not be like the money lenders to them. You shall not charge him interest. So if, if some people do that. They say, well, I'll give you 30 bucks if you give me $35 back. <laughs> don't do that to people. Don't do that to church members. Don't do that to family members. Give and it will be given to you. But if you can't afford it, don't put yourself out there. Number five, get rich quick schemes are for money hungry people. I talked about the love of money is the root of all evil. And Jill, in the spirit of being very fast, number six, 
Even religion will be used for financial dishonesty. Mm. Watch out for those who want to use God's name yeah. to take money from your pocket. At 3ABN, we are not that kind. Thank That's why we don't have, we don't have beg-a-thons. Mm -hmm. We say God knows our needs and we put those in the hand of the Lord. If you do the same thing, you will not be pulled in by get rich quick schemes, and you will not be a surety for someone else's debt. Mm. Amen. 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 I got more to say, but you know, I got to leave it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Wow. Great counsel. Thank you so much. I have Thursday term limits and borrowing points. And uh, I take you now to Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. This is what the lesson brings out. Because the Bible does show that there are uh, term limits to debt in the Bible. Notice this. At the end, at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of debts. Praise the Lord. And this is the form of the release. Every creditor who has lent anything to his neighbor shall release it. He shall not require it of his neighbor or his brother because it is called the Lord's release. Of a foreigner, you may require it, but you shall give it, give up your claim to what is owed by your brother, except when there may be no poor among you, for the Lord will greatly bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance. Only if you carefully obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe with care all these commandments which I command you today. So people look forward to this uh, seventh, the seventh year. Now notice uh, the, the very interesting thought that is brought out here that every se seven years, everybody is debt free. Mm -hmm. No one has any debts. Now, this, of course, lets you know that there's no denial that debts would exist. There are debts, but debts uh, are to be released if not paid by the seventh year. Now, of course, you have these people that try to take advantage of the situation and the Lord knows how to deal with those people. Exodus chapter 21, verse 2, notice uh, that this applies also to this. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve you six years, and in the seventh year, he shall go free and pay nothing. This is the way the Lord has uh, the principles laid out in the Bible. I'm reading now from the lesson uh, that mentions the following. The longest anyone could be in debt was seven years. Whatever else we can take from these verses, they do not show, they do show that the Lord cares about these kinds of financial issues, especially when it concerned fellow Israelites. These verses do not show also, these verses do show also that the Lord acknowledged the reality of debt no matter how bad it generally was, he also emphasized that it was to be avoided as much as possible. And you have heard uh, already some verses where you're supposed to avoid it. Uh, I'll even say it like the plague, <laughs> like the plague. Uh, I remember my first uh, experience with credit. I was still in high school and these, this magazine came to the house and uh, they were offering clothing and different electronic things. And, I, and it said, only five easy payments. And I looked at that. I was in high school, you know, had a little job. And I said, wow, it's only like uh, $20 every month. I can afford that. So I decided to go ahead and purchase a $100 item. I can't remember the exact price, but it was about $100. So I was doing well, paying those $20. About the third month, I was so busy studying and taking tests that I forgot to do the payment. Next thing I know, I get a letter from that company and they said that you now uh, owe us, uh, they added like $35 more, I can't remember the amount. And it was like, what? <laughs> I was so shocked. And I totaled the, per the percentage and it was like over 50% interest or I can't remember the amount. It was just so shocking to me that I wrote them a letter saying, I can't believe you, char you charge this type of interest. I'm done with you, <laughs> here's your final payment. And I went ahead and paid ahead the whole thing. And you know what? I don't know how this uh, catalog is still in business. I think I saw it in a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I got married and this catalog started coming to our house, I said to Idali, you see this magazine? <laughs> this catalog, never buy from these people. <laughs> and so we've never purchased from them. Avoid it like the plague because there are things that you will have to face. I'm gonna talk a little more uh, about credit card debt because this is a huge, huge problem in the United States and probably other countries. According to the Federal Reserve, consumer credit debt in the U.S. topped 
$1.34 trillion dollars in February 2015. Uh, which means that uh, there's slightly over $10,000 of debt for every person in the country. Now, uh, I'm taking you now to 2022. You know, it's interesting because of the stimulus checks coming in because of COVID, people started using those to pay some debt. And at the end of 2022, uh, about $925 billion are all people have in debt. Now, let's take a look at that. You mentioned term limits, the Bible. You know, the Bible mentioned term limits of uh, seven years. It is not so with credit cards and it's not so with other loans. Uh, you have, uh, for example, you mentioned a uh, 10, let's say if you have a $10,000 credit card, re research shows that it will take you uh, more than 12 years if you just pay the minimum payment. And this is why they give you this minimum payment thing. Uh, so they can keep you trapped month by month paying and you wind up, like you've heard before, paying much more for those mm -hmm. items you purchased on credit than if you had cash to pay it. Uh, now, there are health concerns that come with debt. A study from the Northwestern University found that adults aged 24 to 32 had high debt to assets ratio, meaning that if they sold all their belongings, they still wouldn't have enough to pay back what they owed. Mm -hmm. Also tended to report poorer health in general for these individuals. And Dr. Elizabeth Sweet says, we were a bit surprised to see these effects in people so young and otherwise healthy. What kind of problems did they have? Well, there were psycholog psychological problems, mental problems, depression, mm -hmm. and they had serious, serious concerns. We were seeing, it says, we, we're seeing that debt really does have serious impacts on psychological health, says Sweet. It causes a feeling of being underwater and not being able to get out. And uh, also you have people, uh, you, I'm sure you've heard people that they've committed suicide because of debt. Mm -hmm. So if you see yourself getting to a pattern of more and more debt, you have heard, put those credit cards in the freezer <laughs> and uh, don't add any more debt. Deal with the debt you already have. Debt has been linked to depression, mm -hmm. studies show. And uh, here's another one. It may lower your, your immune system. When an individual is stressed, like when dealing with debt, our immune system reacts with a fight or flight response, releasing major ho hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol at elevated levels, says Dr. Jessica Shepard. And so it can lower your immune system. Money worries may keep you awake at night. Mm. She adds, which can also impair your body's ability to fight off in infection. So what do we have? You know, it's not like the Bible is, you know, 20 or 30. Uh, now you have debts 20, 30, 40 years. The Bible shows only seven years, then your release of debt. We don't have that type of thing in society. And if you look at the situation today, uh, the average person owes about $30,000 in debt. $10,000 on credit, $30,000. Uh, actually, I'm talking now about student loans, about $30,000 student loans is a huge problem in the U.S. because universities and colleges have increased their tuition every, practically every single year. And about 55 of students owe uh, debt and they get out, when they get out of school, they have debt and they take years and years to pay. Now, I want to encourage you to, if you have debt, there are plans, there's help, you have heard about budgeting, and I encourage you to follow one of these plans because there's a great, great feeling of being debt free. Yeah. And I, I, uh, we have experienced that and we praise the Lord that you can have this experience and the Lord has uh, given us counsel on this. Avoid it like the plague, uh, it's the, the uh, paraphrase I'm using, avoid it like the plague, Put it in the freezer if you need to do that. Uh, there's, there are times when you seem to have to need these things. And like you said, if you cannot pay it off in a month, then you should not invest in it. Now, I want to talk about another debt that you cannot pay in 10, 20, 30, or 40 years. It's a little departure from what we've heard, but there is a debt of sin that each and every one of us has. For the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there is only one that can get us out of this debt, and that is Jesus Christ. Right. So I want to encourage you to give your heart completely to the Lord, surrender all to Him. And we have the 
promise in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, your sins of debt, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Debt free, mm. made free because of Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to take advantage of that wonderful opportunity that Jesus offers you today to be debt free. Like the, the debt of the world, sin can be a debt that can overwhelm you, depress you, and just make your life miserable. Give it to Jesus. Amen. He's ready to deliver you and bring you debt free because he's already paid the price. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Mm, amen. Thank you guys so much. Such a blessing. Who would have thought that uh, freezer was a multifunctional appliance? <laughs> Learned a lot today. Let's get some final thoughts from the panel. Thank you so much. On Monday's lesson, we looked at following godly counsel, and I'm just so grateful for the gift of my husband, for Greg's counsel, that he followed the counsel in the Word of God, taught me all about delayed gratification, mm -hmm. and what a gift that was in our marriage. So I'm just so grateful for the gift of my husband. Amen. And I just have to confess that I put everything on credit card, but the reason I do that, I still have a budget for my monthly credit card, and we pay it off completely each month so that we're not paying any interest. I know the credit card companies don't like us, but some people use credit cards for points, but if you don't have the uh, ability to do that, and if you're trying to get, we're debt free, so I can do that, but don't use that credit card, put it in the freezer. Finally, you won't be afraid of the fine print if you don't sign the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So don't get in debt. That's simple. Trust the Lord with your finances. Amen. I also encourage you to trust the Lord with your finances. Give it all to Him. Ask Him for wisdom and you will be delivered as well from the debt of sin by trusting in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. We know that you have been blessed. I know I've been blessed. It's such a blessing to have you joining us each week here on 3ABN Sabbath School panel. And you're not going to want to miss next week because next week we're going to reach about the halfway point of this quarter studies. We're going to be on lesson number six, which is entitled Laying Up Treasure in Heaven. So God bless you all. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, hope you have a blessed week.